I don't, I think I mentioned it earlier, but yes, we did. Um, we were able to record, video record, uh, the messages that I taught uh, down in Gasconade Baptist Church. And um, I'll say it again, they were, they were a fantastic church. And um, the people just received everything well. I could tell that they were into it. Um, and when that happens, I know that those people uh, read the Bible. And I know that they uh, are at least well-versed uh, in Scripture. And um, I think most everybody is King James. The pastor said that he had been teaching that uh, for a while, you know, maybe on Sunday night, I think. And uh, he hadn't had anybody give him grief over it or anything like that. And it was actually, um, I, I hope it's a blessing for him. There was a, a lady that came uh, on the Friday night service. And um, they had a little fellowship afterward. They had you know, food and th different things like that. And uh, Lisa and I got our food and she said, where do you want to sit? Well, this lady had asked a question during the during the service, and so I, um, uh, I said, you know, let's go sit by her. And so we sat by her and got to talking to her, and I said, how long have you uh, been listening to, uh, to Brother Sutton? She said, I'll be honest with you, this is the first time I've been to this church. And uh, I think somebody invited her, or she heard about it somehow. Uh, but anyway, she was there Friday, and she, she told me that... Um, she had family members that were in these Pentecostal churches. And she said that, I'd, she said, I've been through all that stuff. And she said, I think it's a bunch of phony stuff. And she said, my husband, he doesn't, he doesn't believe in anything like that. And he said, and she said, especially if I were to start going to one of those churches, and invited him, and he were to come, and I guarantee you, when they come around and touch him on the head, there'd be a little fight there. And uh, she said, I think that I could probably get my husband to this church. Well, he was there the next night. And um, it, was just, it was just a blessing to, to talk to her. And to visit with her and encourage her, and I told her, I said, I, this is my first time here too, and I said, I think this is a good church. I think the pastor's a good guy. And uh, so I hope it works out for her and her husband. And, I, and, and she did say that, um, that her husband had talked to uh, Brother Sutton, and she said he wasn't, he wasn't trying to fight him, he wasn't trying to argue with him, he wasn't trying to get away from him. And um, she said, that's the first preacher that he's ever done that with. And yeah, and so it was just one of those encouraging things. Like I say, I hope it works out for her and her husband. And I hope it works out for the church. And um, they are in a denomination where they are trying to, they're trying to paddle upstream with this denomination. And it's a big denomination too. And they're trying to paddle upstream, and, and my opinion of their denomination and their opinion of their denomination is the same thing. It's very corrupt. It has gotten more corrupt over the years, and there, there isn't hardly any church in that denomination that still stands on the King James. It is, it is very, very difficult to find a church in that denomination that is with the King James. And he said he knows of a couple other pastors that they're... You know, they kind of get together, and, and there was um, a, uh, a man there that um, was a home missions director for the state of that denomination, the state of Missouri. And they were having, um, I don't know what kind of meetings with him, but because of his stand on the King James, there was some preachers that were trying to get rid of him. 
because he uses a King James, and King James guys are dangerous to them. They really, and they don't, see, that's, that's the thing. They don't look at us as people who believe the Bible. They call it a cult. And they have no, they have no idea what a cult is. In a cult, you have secret teachings. In a cult, you have an absolute ruler over people's lives. And I guess they have a problem then with the Bible being an absolute authority over people's lives. But that's what we believe. There is no authority in me other than what little authority that, that God gives me for being pastor. And that's it. But I don't rule over your lives. I don't tell you what you can and cannot do, what you can't eat and can't eat and who you who you going to marry and you got to keep so and so out of here cuz they don't they, we can't let them know our secrets and all that that's that's a cult okay and uh, so they they miss i was going to say misgender us good grief i'm hearing that stuff ah, spray my head antiseptic but anyway um, so that they, they resist missions director that they were trying to get rid of and, and the only reason is his stand on the King James. And they don't want him bringing that up at a, at a meeting or at a church he's preaching at. Or not. They do not want him bringing that up. They hate it that bad. I thought I never thought I would see that day come. But it's here. It's here. So anyway, I'm, I'm so glad that sometime in 1998, and I don't remember the date, but sometime in 1998, God pulled me out and establish me in the word and uh had he not done that i wouldn't no i don't even want to think about it let's start in genesis 3 tonight and kind of go back over this very quickly uh what did i call this uh how how satan infiltrated into eve's mind do you remember the latin phrase that i gave you you remember that? Let's see here. Remember it now? Okay, very good, very good, very good, very good. Modus operandi. So that's what we're going to see. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, if God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. Five words should not be there, but they're there, because she said them, but they're not right, lest she die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not Surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Uh, let's pray, and I'm going to give you a thought that I have. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day you've given us. And we thank you, Lord, for um, the beautiful scenery outside, the trees changing colors, and Lord, all of those good things. We thank you, God, for the word that you have shared with us and the great and mighty things lord that you have shown us that we did not know of and uh, lord for the things that you've shown us before that we forgot that you're reminding us of and lord i pray god tonight that we would learn some things about our enemy satan he is our enemy and we would love to we would love to be part of bruising his head shortly and getting total victory over him a complete and final victory to where we like the israelites with pharaoh we're going to leave him in the bottom of the red sea and we're never ever going to turn back again father i pray dear god that you would uh, just bless your word tonight thank you lord for uh, this meeting today in jesus name and amen. Now, um, let me apply a rule here that I've, that I've been going around telling everybody 
Uh, when it comes to typology, you know, there's some simple things that I give people. Number one, if it's a man, it's either going to be Christ or Antichrist. Now think of Adam. What is he? It's Christ. He is, Christ is the second Adam, or the last Adam, um, and Adam, of course, is the first Adam. Uh, Eve, his wife, now women represent what? Churches, uh, and, and types of churches, good churches, and bad churches, okay? Uh, there are virtuous women, there are strange women, harlot women, uh, evil women. Uh, Jezebel women, things like that. And so um, you have a woman here, and I want you to think about this for a minute. This woman, and this has kind of puzzled me up until now, this woman adds to the Word of God. Okay? I don't think that's not, I don't think it's an accident. I don't think that's a just some random thing that's in the Bible. I think it means something. I think God wants us to know something. So, in this particular case, let's go, let's go to Revelation 21 and find out what happens to a church that adds to the Word of God. Now, we already know this, but let's read it anyway. Just, you know, for for kicks, all right? Verse 18 of Revelation 22, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him, what? The plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy of this book, a uh, book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, so what is the what is the penalty for adding to what God said? Plagues. Think about it. Yes, sir. You just hang with me. So, this woman added to God's word. So the devil said to her, Ye shall not surely die. And she's going to believe that. So think about where we stand right now. She is a, a type of a church. And, it, you know, I would, I would definitely say the Catholic church. But I would say other churches as well that add things to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like the, like the, uh, the Lutheran, Lutheran church that adds... The priest forgiving their sins. That's not part of the gospel. It has nothing to do with the gospel. With the gospel, my sins are forgiven. I don't need the man to tell me that he's going to forgive me again for that week. And so there are other, uh, the charismatic churches, they add to the word of God all the time with their private prophecies and everybody's got tongues and everybody's got words and knowledge and this and that. Uh, the New Apostolic Reformation, they add to the word of God all the time. Bethel Church Reading, they add to the word of God all the time. And so that's how, it's, that's how it happens. That's, that's, that's how it's done. And you've got like the Book of Mormon, you have the Mormon Church and so on. So... Let's just think now that all of these churches that are guilty of adding to God's word, because she set the example, neither shall ye touch it. That's adding to the gospel. That's adding to it. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. So all of, let's just say that all of these churches believe that. They're going to believe this other gospel. And that's what this is. It's another gospel. It's different. So ye shall not surely die. So she believes that. And all of these churches are going to believe that. Then he says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. So this, this church or these churches are going to receive 
satanic illumination. Like that, right? Or what, how is it they do this? The rock, and, the rock and roll people. Yeah. And that's the, the eye, okay? Um, all of those are going to receive dark illumination. And which means that they are going to be baptized into the, um, basically Satan's church receiving Satan's gospel. Okay? They're going to believe another Jesus, they're going to receive another spirit in them, which is going to be Babylon, and they're going to receive another gospel. Because they added to God's word, and they're not repenting about it. Okay, so then, uh, so they receive the illumination, then they're going to believe the promise and receive that promise that they are going to be as gods. Okay, and that's, that idea is what is being set up right now. Uh, so you have... Um, like I've been telling you, here's this pastor, and he's got uh, friends in the denomination that are not budging from the King James, but every other preacher, every one of their seminaries, um, all of their scholars, they, they've got their own Bible, uh, all of it, they ha with their own Bible, they've taken it away from God's Word. They've taken stuff out. Um, but when you do that, eventually, you have to put something back in. You have to replace it with something. And so what they're replacing it with now is, these are all the churches that they have these beautiful, beautiful sanctuaries like ours. Um, but they'll take down every one of those lights and darken the sanctuary. You know, if... If this church, if, if something happened to me and this church voted in one of those new pastors, wouldn't it be a shame if he hired a company to come in here and sprayed black paint all over that woodwork? But they would. Or chances are he would try to get you into a building program because we can't, we can't get people into a building that looks like a church because that offends them. And we can't preach the cross either because that offends them too. So we'll just get into a new building that just looks like a theater and it'll, it'll be set up the way he wants it set up. It'll be dark in the sanctuary, it'll be light on the stage, and that's, and, and that's how it'll happen. But anyway, uh, you've got uh, with, with all of these churches that add to the Word of God, adding something else to the Word of God, adding another gospel to the Word of God or whatever it is, uh, they're going after another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. They're the ones who, are who, are, who want this that Satan just offered to them. They want that illumination and they want to be as gods and they want to live forever in this life. And why would you want to... The, there is only one reason why you would want to live forever in this body. What would it be? Sin... Sin, because already they're diminishing what sin is. They're diluting sin. And they're making sin into something that we do. We're the cult, right? Because we believe the Bible. That's, and that's all it is with us. We believe every word in this Bible. But we're the cult. And so they call us evil. They call themselves good. Okay? I, I had the, um, I won't say it was the opportunity, well, it may have been an opportunity, it was a learning thing with me, uh, to, I was being led early on, uh, all the way back in Rich Woods, all the way back to my Bible college days, I was being led by liberal pastors. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was being, I was being guided by some men, and, and I had their names in my head, but I won't give them out. 
but they were, uh, they were liberal pastors, and they were trying to lead me away from being conservative to being liberal, and they would, they would tell jokes about the conservative preachers, and they would, they would mock them and make fun of them in my presence, and they were, they were hoping that I would laugh with them about that, and in a lot of ways I did, uh, but I can clearly see that the devil had these men leading me astray. And it was very subtle, wasn't overt, but it was, this was, um, uh, in some cases, before I ever married your mom. This goes way back before then. Uh, but the, it was being done. And um, so, thank God, uh, God gave me some other men in my life, Brother Mike Hutzel, Brother Reg Kelly, uh, Brother Lonnie Burke, some, and, and others that were leading me in the right direction, and I thank God for that. Uh, but I just, uh, just this little side teaching here, I, I, this is really the first time I've really just kind of talked about it, uh, is that I think Eve represents here uh, liber- these churches that have added to the Word of God, or they've, they've replaced the gospel somehow, some way, and... Um, they are the ones who are going to accept this new gospel. This new gospel, I believe, according to Galatians 1, is going to come down from heaven in the hands of an angel. There is going to be a a heavenly messenger that is going to bring these down. And that's what Paul is getting at. Though we or an angel from heaven bring you any other gospel. Well, I think that's not just some talk. I think he just told us what, where it's coming from. And, I mean, is that true? Well, what happened with, with Joseph Smith? It was an angel from heaven, the angel Moroni, that gave him the golden plates and told him about, you know, the, the Book of Mormon and all this stuff. It was an angel that led um, Ellen White into her false doctrine of, of, of the gospel is... Uh, going to church on Saturday, that's the gospel. And, uh, and she received that. And then you have um, uh, the, uh, these others that, um, like in the Pentecostal movement, that are having visions and dreams and so on. I, was, um, I played yesterday uh, for, the, for, the, for the church this video clip that I have of Perry Stone uh, interviewing his father, um, I can't, uh, can't remember his name, uh, uh, but anyway, he was, he was talking to his father because his father uh, be- said that years ago, an old friend of his by the name of Al Collins, who had already died, that his ghost appeared to him and called him to preach the gospel, called him into the ministry. He said, I was called into the ministry by the, by the spirit man of this guy named Al Collins who had, was already dead. That's necromancy. That's forbidden in the Bible. But then he said that he got to see, he was up in heaven, this library that he was transported into heaven and he saw this library. And it was the library of heaven. It was called the, uh, the, the words and acts of Jesus Christ. And it was book after book after book after book of all the things that Jesus said and did that were not in the Gospel of John. Now, that's a, that is a misrepresentation of Scripture. Because John 20, 21 actually says that, um, well, I better read it. Almost had it. Almost had it. The words mean something here. Amen? Look at at John, the last chapter, the last verse. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one. I suppose that even the world itself cannot contain the books that should be written. What does it say about them being written? If they were written. It does not say they were written. It does not say that. Okay? It's sort of like, uh, if you look in um, 2 Corinthians 12. So, 
so get this. Remember what I said about adding to the Word of God? Perry Stone's teaching of a library in heaven full of the words of Jesus Christ that are not in the Gospels, that's adding to the Word of God. It is. And they, and they twist Scripture to do it. Now look at 2 Corinthians 12. A lot, of, um, a lot of charismatics and Pentecostal tongue talkers use this passage illegally. They say that um, in, in, in 2 Corinthians 12, 2, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And it says in verse 4, how he that was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. They say that they're speaking the language of heaven here uh, where they heard the unspeakable words. But keep reading. These words are not lawful for man to speak. So man cannot um, speak, speak those words. Man cannot say them. Because it's unlawful for man to do that. So don't tell me that God then gives you that language to speak when the Bible clearly says that he, it's unlawful for us to do that. So it's not going to happen. But these guys, they claim then that the words that they speak are the words of God that cannot be uttered and they're unlawful to speak. What they're doing is adding to the word of God. And I'm, you know, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just tired and off my rocker. But you know that you know that phrase means, don't you? You're too old and you're up, you fell out of the rocking chair. Okay, you went to sit down in your rocker and missed it because you're too old. Okay, you're off your rocker. Um, but I don't think so. And so all of the all of the people. All of the churches that add to the word of God or replace the gospel with this, they're, they're going to get this. They're going to, they're going to take whatever this fruit and its representation is in these last days. They're going to partake of it. And when they do, they believe that it's going to give them illumination and that they will be as God's. And that's going to be their new gospel, okay? Uh, with the new apostolic reformation, it looks, what it looks like is what they refer to themselves as Joel's army or the new breed. A new breed basically is a new species, which means they've had their DNA altered literally to be the product of sons of God, daughters of men. So, this this, understand this as the devil's method of operation, his modus operandi. So we go back uh, to Matthew 4, turn there. And what we're going to see is the devil being consistent. And, you know, for years I never really caught on to this. Uh, but one day it just, I mean, just seemed like God said, hey, Mike, wake up. I got something for you here. And, uh, and it dawned on me that the very same uh, temptations that Eve had, Jesus endured. And I've also noted that um, while Eve, was, her belly was completely full, and she was not weak in any way, uh, she already had access to all of the other fruit that was in the garden. She could have eaten anything uh, she could have made her a salad, a fruit salad, a vegetable salad, or a vegetable fruit salad. She could have made anything and eaten it and had her belly full, but she chose this one fruit. And that's the nature of man. It's the wicked nature of man. No matter what we have, we think we've got to have something else. Okay? And, um, I mean, that's just how it is. So, now, in uh, Matthew 4, the devil shows up. 
The Bible says, Then was Jesus, verse 1, led up to the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And Jesus, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he afterward was hungered. In other words, he did, the devil didn't come to him until 40 days had transpired. Jesus, not only has he not eaten, he's, not, he's weak and he's starving after 40 days. And so the devil comes to him in weakness, but Jesus is able to remain pure and free from sin, defeating Satan's um, temptation. And I know that preachers will use this as an illustration and say, uh, Jesus showed us that if we just quote scripture, it can be done. I don't believe that. I believe that only Jesus can beat off the devil for us. Only Jesus can. And, um, and when he does it, it's done. It, it, you have all these stories of the disciples who couldn't cast out certain devils. But Jesus could. And this is one of those things that Adam and Eve couldn't do, but Jesus did. And so look at verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, uh, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And I've eaten some bread like that. Amen. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So temptation number one, lust of the flesh. Verse four, or verse five. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, or concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now, let me pause in the method of operation right here, the teaching. And let me add something to how the devil does things. You notice that he's quoting scripture here. Let's go to Psalm 91, because that's where he's quoting it from. Psalm 91, turn there. It's funny to me that the devil picked this particular passage. And it's funny because of what the devil left out. And, there, and there's a lesson here. Okay? It ain't, it ain't what the devil said. It's what he didn't say. And that also can be applied to the preachers nowadays. Because some will say, well, they preach the Bible. And I think that a lot of these people who defend their pastors have gotten so used to getting one small crumb of Scripture at the beginning of their pastor's sermon. And then for the next 20, 30, 40 minutes... Nothing. So it's not what he says. It's what he doesn't say. Okay? So let's look at Psalm 91. And, and we'll pick it up where the devil left off. Uh, verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Uh, by the way, throw a little UFO conspiracy stuff in here. Um, Steven Spielberg wrote the script 
for close encounters of the third kind. And in the storyline, the government selects 12 people, uh, 10 men and two women, that are going to, they are going to send up to the mothership, the alien mothership, to go to their planet up in the heavens. Okay? And there is a scene where the mothership has come down and those, those 12 people are about, and I hope you're getting this number here, 12 people, okay? And the, there's a scene where these 12 people are in a chapel that's been set up and there is a, uh, a, uh, an army uh, chaplain and it, it turns out that they actually, Spielberg actually hired an army chaplain to play this part. And they're sitting there getting their final blessing from God and a prayer said over them. And the scene is they're sitting there and the, the army chaplain is reading from a book and he is quoting this passage, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. What are those aliens? They're angels. They're angels. Spielberg knows, he knows the old, he's a Jew. Spielberg knows the, the he's a Jew, he knows the Old Testament. And, and I just always thought that that was there for a reason. Number one, because it was, came out of the Satan's mouth. But number two, it was like we're handing these guys over to these angelic beings that are going to take them to this happy home in the sky. And um, there is, there is a, um, a very intriguing UFO story that is supposed to be real that says that the army or that the military uh, did actually make an agreement with an alien race to trade 12 humans for one alien and that these 12 humans did go to a place and some of them ended up coming back years later. I don't know if it's true, so I don't really, I, I don't really say it. Anyway, verse 12, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. But the devil stopped right there. Read the next verse. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, and the devil is both of them. Amen. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Hey, Satan, how come you didn't read that part? What's wrong with you? You afraid? I just always thought that was funny. He's, he makes such a big deal about, oh, that's the word of God, right? That's the word of God. Well, keep reading, Satan. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. The devil should have just kept on quoting. But see, that's the thing. He is taking two verses from the Bible way out of context. And had they remained in the context, the devil could have never used them because it basically is a a condemnation of him. And Jesus knows this. So back in Matthew. Um, verse 7. Jesus said unto him. It is written again. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Which means. Everybody. Kids. Don't go jumping off bridges. Because your friends tell you to. Uh, my nephew Jacob. Did that jumped off the hematite bridge down in Joachim, broke his leg. Yep, because he got dared to do it, okay? Literally, he jumped off a bridge because his friends told him to. 
Okay. <laughs> I'm like, it's the one thing you weren't supposed to do. <laughs> but he did it anyway. So anyway, don't do it. Uh, you're not supposed to tempt God, which is why when God said they shall take up serpents, he didn't mean that you go around picking up snakes, you idiots. You're tempting God in doing that. Uh, and we tempt God in other ways. Uh, this idea that you can just pray a prayer one time, don't mean it, but you're saved now. So you can go out and sin all the sins you want to, and you, be, you become an atheist and a sodomite and everything else, and turn your back completely against God, but somehow, some way, you're forcing God to forgive you. You're tempting God. And God said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Then, verse 8, Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, showeth him all the kingdoms of the world. The other gospels say in a moment of time, uh, which gives me the indication that he not only showed him the current kingdoms of the world, but he showed him the ones past, the ones present, and the ones future. And uh, the flat earth people love this one because they say this proves the earth is flat. No, it proves there's a fourth dimension. It proves there is a dimension that is above this one that can actually see the in all sides of a globe at once. Okay, because that's how it works. Anyway, taking up to a high mountain, showed them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. You see, that's the lust of the eyes. Lust of the eyes. Because he sees all the kingdoms and the dazzling glory of them. This is, the devil knows this. Because he is covered in all these precious stones. That means he reflects this light in dazzling ways. Uh, if you've ever gone into a Catholic church, you know what I'm talking about when I say it is very uh, interesting. It's very appealing. It is luring. All of that gold, all of those statues, marble statues, all of those things that are in a Catholic church, I mean, they spend millions and millions of dollars. I would like to go to St. Peter's Basilica. Because I, I do have some sense of the absolute awe at its immense size, number one. I mean, this building is, it goes on forever. Literally, the Pope can be giving Mass uh, in the nave of this, which is where the high altar is, the papal altar, they call it, uh, with those four pillars there, and there can be another mass going on down toward the end of it, and they wouldn't know each other were there. That's how big this thing is. And um, the, the artwork, the statues, the gold, the, uh, the carvings, the Vatican Museum is, is without a doubt the wealthiest museum in the world. They have everything in there. The Vatican Art Museum is, they've got more art than the Louvre probably. Um, but that's all to dazzle the eyes of people. It is lust of the eyes. It is a, it is a harlot church who adorns herself so well that most people can't turn it down. I mean, I, I hear of people all the time turning Catholic. Why? I think, it's, I think they got dazzled into it, is what I think. And I think that they fell for this idea that these rituals that the church does and them being a part of that makes them closer to God, that makes them feel like they are, but they're not. But it's all about the dazzling of the eyes. And he shows the glory of them. In verse 9, he saith unto them, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then, G And if, boy, if, if Satan could have heard what we played in Sunday school this morning. Oh man, you guys missed it. It was awesome. I mean, there was, there was people just crying in here this morning. Because um, I had all the lyrics 
to the Hallelujah Chorus up on the screen, both verses, uh, Revelation 19, 6, and Revelation uh, 11, uh, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth, uh, and so on, and all that, and just the beauty of the music. <sighs> Doodads. I was crying last night, putting it together. Uh, then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt, not, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, this is the devil's method of operation. When he tempts us, he will tempt us with the lust of the flesh. Uh, I didn't tell you the part about jumping off the cliff because he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. That's pride of life. But then we have the, the lust of the eyes. And all three times Jesus answers with scripture. And um, so that method of operation is how he will do it. But then verse 11 says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. That's the part that you need to understand, is that no temptation lasts forever. The devil, being a beast, does give in. Let me show you this. Uh, James 4, 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Is that That's exactly what he did. Is The devil left him. He couldn't take it anymore. He didn't double back and say, well, let's try this again some other way. Uh, he tempted him those three ways. Jesus did not uh, waver in his resolve not to sin. And the devil, when he realized that he could not tempt Jesus, he left him. And that's what the Bible says will happen with you. If you resist him, he will flee because he cannot, he cannot bear your presence resisting him eventually he will leave so basically it's a it's a game of who can last the longest okay and it's a waiting game and uh, I know the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life sometimes those lusts are strong uh, but figure out something to do and and pray and ask God for help because I do believe that God is the only, Christ is the only one who can be victorious in this. And he will share that victory with us uh, if we allow him to. And I'm telling you, there's nothing like resisting the devil and watching him leave. Amen? Let's stand to our feet.